Hi, I'm Hafiz again and I'm going to take you through to the life cycle costing in this session. So let's get started. Life cycle costing. Life cycle account costing or life cycle accounting is a slightly different system to the accounting uh, which is not part of the uh, financial reporting environment. Uh, life cycle costing is generally applied by the accountants for a number of reasons and the way this method works, life cycle costing, when we accumulate the cost and the revenues of the product over its life cycle. So rather than doing the accounting, financial accounting, uh, which revolves around the periods of time, we do the life cycle costing of the product over the life cycle of the product. Generally, you are familiar with the general systems of accounting, bookkeeping or accounting. Uh, when the financial statements are produced for a period of time, generally one year of time, so we produce the income statement or statement of comprehensive income for one year. We produce the balance sheet or statement of financial position at the end of the year, cash flow statements for the year and so on, consolidated reports by the end of the year. But in life cycle costing, we don't produce the accounts definitely by end of the year. We produce the accounts when the product starts and we end the accounts of the product when the life of the product ends. So if the product remains in the market for three months, it's accounting for three months. If the product remains in market for five years, it is accounting for five years. So there is no boundary for the periods, okay? So it is the idea of cradle to grave. From cradle to grave is it starts from when the product starts initiation of the product and it ends at the death of the product when the product is finally removed from the shelves okay now the question is why do we need life cycle costing for reason being actually a number of people consider this life cycle costing before i go into more details a number of people consider life cycle costing as project accounting as well Okay, project accounting. For example, construction project. So if the construction project completes in six months, it's accounted for six months. If construction project remains in the market for three years, for example, building, construction, and so on, three years, and it's accounted for three years. Why do we need project accounting or life cycle accounting for? Reason being, a number of times we feel that when we produce the accounts for one year, a number of times these accounts may be misleading, misleading in this way, that a number of projects take longer to complete, okay, two, three, four, five years to complete. So in one year, we do not know the overall success or overall failure of the project or product, okay. In one year, the results are so small, we may not get the overall picture of the product. So therefore, we apply the life cycle accounting. In life cycle accounting, please remember, it is a system of accumulation of all costs and it is a system of accumulation of all revenues over the period of time, okay? In general calculations, we apply the same methodology, okay? Like we calculate the cost of materials, cost of labor and overheads. And one step further in life cycle accounting, we include all costs in life cycle cost which have been related to the product, okay? So first of all, let me show you some list of costs and then I will talk about where life cycle accounting is useful, okay? Research and development costs. Now you would appreciate research and development costs are treated in a different way in the normal general financial accounting systems. Like research cost is recorded as an expense when it is incurred and development cost may be recorded as an expense, it may be recorded as a capital expenditure in the balance sheet. But it never becomes, whether it is a research or it is development, it is never made a part of the cost of sales or it never becomes value of the inventory. Uh, 
cost of purchasing and any technical data required. For example, you know, we buy any royalties or any patents, copyrights or any formulae which become uh, intangible assets for the company. And you know, intangible assets are recorded in the balance sheet or statement of financial position. So again, these royalties or these uh, technical data that never becomes part of the inventory valuation as per company standards. Training costs you would appreciate. Uh, generally, training costs are amortized in the expenses section. Terminal costs or close down costs, these become part of the expenses or overheads. So, when huge millions of dollars of these type of costs never become part of the cost of sales or never become part of the inventory valuation, how can we say our inventory valuation is appropriate or accurate? What normal accounting systems do, they only record as part of cost of sales the cost of direct materials, direct labor and any factory or production overheads. Whereas all research and development cost of purchasing or these technical data, training cost, closing or terminal cost or any advertising or specific marketing relating to the product that remains in abeyance that remains as part of the expenses away from the inventory valuation or part of the value of the product, okay? So these are, our aim is whatever the name of cost is. Now here is a very important statement. Regardless of the name of the cost, whether it is direct materials, direct labor, variable, fixed, selling, distribution, administration, research, design, development, training, closing down, whatever the name of the cost, long as the cost has been incurred or will be incurred relating to the product, it becomes part of the life cycle cost of the product. So please remember one idea which I normally apply to learn or understand for the exam purposes. It is simply a system of add everything together. Add everything together, meaning is right from day one to the last day of the product, if we have spent any money directly relating to the product, whatever the name is, add all costs. And by adding all costs gives us life cycle cost of a product. And if we divide life cycle cost of the product by the expected volumes, we simply get life cost per unit life cost per unit and including life costs you need to appreciate there are all type of costs whatever the name is we just aim to add all of them together and by adding them together it gives us total life costs of the product and then we divide all of them by the expected volumes of the product and we get life cost per unit Okay, so a number of aims can be kept in mind while applying life cycle accounting. Okay, life cycle costing. So following are some of the objectives or aims of life cycle costing or you can call them advantages if you like. Number one, it gives us overall average life cost per unit which does not ignore any cost it includes every single expenditure into the cost which has been incurred in relationship to the product okay number two with the help of this overall average life cycle cost per unit we can develop life selling price Per unit. So that can give us some idea what should be appropriate selling price of the product. Number three, it will also tell us if for example the life selling price based upon our expectation is lower than the overall cost of the product. For example, if we feel at the beginning of the project that our selling price in the future may become lower than the cost, then we can think of 
how can we change the product so right from the beginning or initiation of the product we can change the product design or anything okay so it it emphasizes cost control from the beginning right from the start it emphasizes on the cost control how can we control the cost now so that the next three four five years can be successful number four also life cycle costing is used to evaluate the project as a whole to see the overall success or failure of a product whether the product will be successful or otherwise over the life okay also it can help us to determine cash flows over the life cycle would we generate enough cash from this product over the life sufficient to develop a new product sufficient to generate return on investment sufficient to pay off other expenses increase in wages etc or not okay also with the help of life cycle accounting we can determine appropriate volumes over life that how many units do we need to sell in order to break even how many more units we need to sell in order to recover investment cost okay so a number of aims or benefits or objectives can be relating to the life cycle accounting principle okay idea is very simple add everything together so what we do is we add total cost of the product over life then we work out the total revenue of the product over life and total revenue minus total cost is simply total profit of the product over life or total loss of the product over life that's all about life cycle accounting now life cycle accounting or costing is so tiny in our paper f5 syllabus it is very very hard it can be examined on its own okay so just like target costing examiners add things from here and there a number of times in life cycle accounting examiners give us some kind of losses wastages idle time any high low method or semi variable cost sometime examiners include learning curve in order to expand the data okay later on we will talk about learning curve separately okay or examiners can attach life cycle accounting with target costing to expand question to 10 or 15 marks because both target costing and life cycle accounting are very tiny parts of the syllabus not like activity based costing so one area on its own may not make a complete question so generally life cycle accounting and target costing can be examined together okay let's move on and have a look at this example a on plc okay requirements are there are two requirements in here a is using a life cycle costing approach calculate the profits now using life cycle costing approach and remember what was life cycle costing approach and everything together you will see in a minute calculate the profits under approach 1 and 2 i don't know what is approach 1 and 2 at the moment but one thing i know profits profit is simply revenue minus costs sales minus costs and requirement b is if the target profit for any product sold by the company is 40% what is the target cost of product 801 oh so see you they have attached target cost what is the target cost of product 801 and then there is this and meaning there is something more to it also calculate whether the lifetime costs per unit of approach 1 and approach 2 would give costs less than the target cost what is that oh yes you are telling me that we are going to compare lifetime costs of approach 1 and 2 with the target costs okay and whenever we we compare 
the ex ex expected or current cost with the target cost, what do we expect to get? We expect to get a cost gap. We will see as well. Okay, so it's like a mixture of life cycle and target costing. Explain using calculations where possible how any cost gaps could be closed in this case. So we will have a look at this part as well. <coughs> so that's how examiners expand life cycle accounting. Okay. Okay. Avon PLC is designing a new high-tech consumer product currently known as Product 801. The research and development, design and management accounting teams have estimated that the product 801 could be developed and manufactured in one of two ways. Okay, Approach 1 is the simpler option and approach 2 requires more development and additional machinery to manufacture the product in a more efficient way. So approach 1 and 2, now I have slightly better idea. These are two different ways of producing product 801. One method is slightly simple and second method uses more efficient way of doing the things by using latest technology. Market research shows that product 801 should sell for $50 per unit. Okay, so you would appreciate whether it is approach 1 or 2, it should sell for $50 per unit. Okay. They've given us some details of each approach one by one. Development costs, variable manufacturing cost per unit, repair and warranty costs, $50 per unit need, needing repairs and 1% of sales will incur these costs. 1% of sales I will explain after. And cleanup and machinery dismantling costs at the end of production $50,000. More or less the same type of details are given for approach 2 as well, so let's not read it, we will read it afterwards. The last paragraph is, the life of product 801, if developed and manufactured using approach 1, should be 5 years and 50,000 units per year should be sold. Because of the higher level of research used in approach 2, the life of the, life of the product will be increased to 6 years. Okay, so if we sell the product as per approach 1, life will be 5 years. But if, let's say, we start doing approach number 2, life will be extended to 6 years because probably more expensive machinery, they need more time to recover their investment. Okay, now let's use the life cycle accounting approach and calculate profits under approach 1 and then approach 2. So here we go. Requirement A. Okay. Using life cycle costing, calculate profits under approach 1 and 2. So what if I put down the approaches in two columns? Let's say this is approach 1 and this is approach number 2. Okay, just to save a little time, otherwise we could have presented them on one separate page each approach. Because numbers are too many, we can put down these numbers in thousands of dollars to save a little more time in exams. Okay, now let's do the revenue. Because remember, meaning of profit is sales minus cost. So first of all, let's calculate revenue or sales. Under the approach 1, sales will be selling price is $50 per unit. They told us 50,000 units will be sold in a year over five years. Why did I put down just 50? Because remember there are three zeros there as well. So I'm hiding three zeros. Is it okay? So 50 times by 50 into five years, it is 12,500. And if I was using all the zeros, then it would have been 12,500,000, too many zeros, okay? Now here is less costs and actually it's better if I write down life cycle costs meaning I don't really care what's the name of the cost I just need to include all of them okay under the approach one let's deal with both of them one by one under the approach one first one is development cost one two five zero
Okay, because we are going to calculate profits, so sales minus cost. So that's why the costs are putting them in the brackets. Okay. Second one is variable manufacturing cost, which is per unit. Okay. So variable costs. which is $25 per unit, uh, sorry, $20 per unit, uh, 25 I think, I was thinking of the wrong line, is here, $25 per unit, 50,000 units will be sold over 5 years, ignoring three zeros. Okay, so I'm repeating, it was not 50, it was 50,000 units, which I have picked up from the last paragraph, here. Okay, but because I'm ignoring three zeros in every calculation, so that's why it becomes 50. So 25 times 50 into 5 years, which is 6250. Is it okay? Afterwards, the next one is repair and warranty costs which are $30 per unit again per unit needing repairs sorry I picked up the phone line again repairs and warranty costs $50 per unit needing repairs and 1% of sales will incur these costs so under approach 1 if something goes wrong with a unit we will spend $50, to, sorry, $50 per unit to fix the problem and 1% of sales will incur these costs. Now, this is not 1% of sales revenue, okay? Because we don't fix the dollars. I mean, we don't fix the dollar notes, okay? Something goes wrong with the product. So this is actually 1% of the sales volume. It's not given, but you must appreciate that we will sell one unit and the unit will come back to us being faulty. So this is 1% of sales volume, not the US. Okay, so here is repairs and warranty. Okay, we will sell 50,000 units over 5 years. And 1% of these units may come back to us, which will be subject to $50 for repairing cost. Okay, and let's see how much it adds up to. 50 times by 5 into 1% into 50, which is $125,000. Ignoring three zeros, one, two, five. Okay, and then the last one is clean up and machinery dismantling cost at the end of production, meaning it's a one-off cost at the end of production. And this will result in a life cycle profit. because the information has completed and the profit comes to 12,500 minus 1250 minus 6250 minus 125 and 50 and the total profit is 4825 for 4 million eight hundred and twenty five thousand dollars this is as per approach number one very similar calculations in approach number two as well so did you notice it how easier life cycle accounting on its own can be okay simply total revenue over life minus total costs over life let's have a look at the approach number two which is here okay first of all sales okay remember the only difference is that in approach number two, life will be extended to six years. So it will become like this. 50 multiplied by 50,000 units times by six years. Okay. So the red numbers are for approach number two. So 50 times by 50,000 units over six years. In total, it comes to 15,000. 
only one difference that life will be extended to six years. Now here is the development costs. The development costs are two, three, five, zero. Okay. Here is the variable manufacturing costs, which is twenty dollars per unit. So here is the calculation for variable manufacturing cost: twenty dollars per unit times by fifty thousand units over six years. So twenty into fifty thousand into six years. Which is six thousand. Now here is the next one: repairs and warranty costs, which is thirty dollars per unit needing repairs, and only half a percentage of sales volume will incur these costs. So because of the latest technology, the amount of returns will become less. Okay. So here we go. We will sell fifty thousand units over six years. And only 0.5% units will come back to us, and each unit will be fixed for less money, which is 30 dollars per unit in repairs. Okay, so 50 into six years into 0.5% times by 30, which is 45. Okay, so repair costs will go down in this approach. The next one is additional fixed cost per year to run the new manufacturing machinery, 20,000. So there is one additional cost in here, which I can write down in one line. Uh, additional fixed costs, which is $20,000 per year. And again, I'm ignoring three zeros. Okay, into six years because we will run this machinery for six years, so that amounts to one hundred and twenty thousand. But in only three zeros, one twenty. Okay, and last one is cleanup and machinery dismantling costs thirty dollars, sorry thirty thousand dollars at the end of the production process, terminal costs, and that results in the final profit of approach number two. So let's have a look at the calculator. 15,000 minus 2350 minus 6,000 minus 45 minus 30 minus 120, which is 6455. And that's the life cycle costing profits. Okay? So it looks like from the information provided, Approach number two generates a higher total profit than approach number one over the life. Okay, let's have a look at the part B. In part B, there are three things you would appreciate. There are three things in part B. First is calculate the target cost. Remember how do we calculate target cost? Target cost is the expected selling price and remember selling price is $50 per unit. Less profit margin and which is always given to us as a percentage. And in requirement B, we are told profit margin of the company is 40%. So 40% times by 50 is 20. So 50 minus 20 target cost is 30 dollars. Means maximum company can spend on one product 801 is 30 dollars. If company will spend less than 30, brilliant, well done. And if company spends more than 30 dollars, company will be in trouble. Company needs to save the cost. Company needs to reduce the cost. Okay, so this is first part of requirement B. Now let's have a look at the second part. Calculate whether the lifetime cost per unit of approach 1 and 2 would give costs 
less than target cost. So let's look at the lifetime cost of approach 1 and then approach 2 and see which one gives us less. So first of all, approach 1, lifetime or life cycle costs per unit. Remember the formula I was talking about, total life cycle costs divided by total volumes. So total life cycle costs we can find out from here, okay, by looking at approach 1. I'm adding all costs of approach 1, okay, and in short it amounts to 7675. Okay, ignoring three zeros. Divided by 250,000 units, again ignoring three zeros. 50,000 units in one year, or I can write down separately if you want. 50,000 units in one year, over five years. And that gives us life cycle cost per unit. So 7675 over 250, it comes to 30.70 per unit. Ah, looks like there is a cost gap if we produce product 801 using approach number one. Because target is $30 only and lifetime cost of approach 1 is 30.7 so extra 70 cents is overspending. Let's have a look at approach number 2. Approach 2 life cycle costs <coughs> per unit Okay, so here we go. First of all, we need to add total cost of approach number two. Two, three, five, zero, plus six thousand, plus forty five, plus thirty, plus one twenty, and total is eight five four five. Divided by fifty thousand units per year over six years. Remember the life would be extended to six years and that comes to 28.48 and now it looks like if the target is $30 approach number two gives cost less than the target. Okay and I can Give this statement in one line or so. Okay. As per above calculations, approach two gives costs less than. Target cost and as per approach two, so the approach one, a cost gap of seventy cents per unit exists. Okay. Because target cost is 30 dollars and the approach one life cycle cost is 30.70. So this additional overspending of 70, 70 cents per unit will be defined as the cost gap. And that becomes the basis for the last requirement of part B. Explain using calculations where possible how any cost gaps could be closed in this case. So only one cost gap exists which is as per approach number one. There is no cost gap of approach number two. So here are some of the possible suggestions in which cost gap could be closed.
So let's have a look at the approach number one, where the cost gap of 70 cents per unit exists. Okay? Now, if you remember target costing, which I was explaining in a different session, okay, idea is that management needs to explore and investigate every single area of manufacturing to see how any cost reduction can be made possible, how any cost control can be made possible. So, it's like an open world to the management. They need to write from the design stage to the end. They need to investigate every single area of production, manufacturing, sale, etc. Okay? Here, based upon the information provided, I can suggest one or two good options. Okay? Uh, of course, company may not be able to save all this money from one area, okay? But as I mentioned in the target costing session, every little helps, okay? Maybe a little saving from one area, a little saving from another, as much as possible. So here are a few things. Let's compare cost gap with the development cost. Okay, 70 cents per unit and development cost of approach 1, if I go back in here, 2350. Okay, now because development cost is given for a whole life and 70 cents is only for one unit, so times by 50,000 units over 5 years will give us total cost gap over 5 years and if I multiply this by 100 it will give me some kind of idea how much of development cost needs to be reduced by in order to close the cost gap so 70 cents times by 50,000 units into 5 years divided by 2350,000 and that comes to 7% or so so 70 cents into 50,000 into 5 years divided by 2, 3, sorry it's not 2, 3, 5, 0 by mistake. I'm looking at approach 2. Approach 1 is 1, 2, 5, 0, sorry my apologies. Here it should be 1, 2, 5, 0. Gap exists in approach number one only, so I was picking up numbers on the approach two. Uh, divided by one, two, five, zero, and that comes to 14%. Meaning to say is, development costs should be reduced by 14% in order to close the cost gap. Now, I don't know what kind of development costs are these. Management needs to, top management needs to investigate and explore how much of 14% can be possible. May not be full 14%, but any little helps, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5%, whatever can be reduced is better. Okay? Secondly, variable manufacturing. So, cost gap is 70 cents per unit. And variable costs, if I go back to pick the right figure, approach $125 per unit. Now both numerator and denominator are per unit. I don't need to multiply them by units. Okay? If one cost is in units uh, per unit and the other one is over the life, then I have to bring it them into a like with like situation. So 0.7 over 25 times 100, which is 2.8%. Meaning to say is, the company must reduce or should try to reduce variable costs by 2.8% in order to close the cost gap. Now you would appreciate variable costs includes direct materials, so maybe some discounts from the suppliers or use of slightly cheaper materials or labor costs, maybe improving the efficiency a little bit more and cost gap can be closed or looking at the variable overheads or any associated direct or kind of overheads if there is any known value addition we can try to eliminate it in order to close the cost gap so this is how cost gaps are closed okay 
So these are important specific suggestions I'm talking about, not just general one. That management needs to investigate and wherever possible they will reduce the cost. So that was life cycle costing along with a little touch of the target costing as well. Okay. Please re revise from the books and the material study material, then watch it again, then try to solve some practice questions so that the confidence level can be boosted. Any issues, you know how to get back to us. Waiting for your feedback. Take care. All the very best. Goodbye.